Diodes are electronic components that are made up of semiconductors. The two most common semiconductors used are silicon and germanium. When we look at the periodic table, you will find these elements in group 4 or group 14. This means that they have 4 valence electrons. And this is very important because this is why they will form giant covalent molecules. Each silicon atom is going to be bonded with another 4 silicon atoms. The red dots represent the valence electrons of each silicon atom. Each silicon atom is going to share one electron with another silicon atom and therefore it will form a covalent bond with the silicon atom that is beside it. This happens to another three silicon atoms as well to form this structure. Depending on the temperature of the surrounding, the electrons that are involved in these covalent bonds are going to have kinetic energy. If we look carefully at the whole silicon structure, some of the electrons will have enough energy to escape from this bonding, from this covalent bonding and exist as free electrons. These free electrons are what enable silicon to be a semiconductor. A semiconductor is able to conduct electricity. It is not a good conductor of electricity like metals and it is also not an insulator like non-metals. It is in between them. When the electron leaves, it also leaves behind what we call a hole. A hole is an absence of electron where a covalent bond can be formed. In a pure semiconductor, also called intrinsic semiconductor, these free electrons are very few. There are not many free electrons and therefore it is not a very good conductor of electricity. However, we can change this through a process known as doping. Doping is a process of adding foreign atoms into the silicon, the pure silicon. Through doping, we can either make a P-type semiconductor or an N-type semiconductor. In order to form a P-type semiconductor, we add an atom that has only three valence electrons. Remember, silicon has four valence electrons. So whenever we add a foreign atom that only has three valence electrons, this is what it's going to look like. The example here uses boron. So if we add boron into the mix, into the structure of silicon, what we will get is wherever the boron atom is bonded with the silicon atoms, there will naturally be one hole because boron only has three valence electrons. And so when we add many boron atoms, wherever the boron atom bonds with the silicon atoms, there will be holes. By adding boron into the structure of the pure silicon, we have managed to create a lot more holes than a pure silicon semiconductor would have. This is known as the P-type semiconductor. For an N-type semiconductor, the foreign substance that is added has five valence electrons. An example here is phosphorus. When you add phosphorus into the mix, into the structure, wherever phosphorus bonds with the silicon atoms, there is one extra electron. Because phosphorus has five valence electrons, only four are involved in bonding, there will be one electron and this electron can easily become a free electron. What we have done here is create a lot more free electrons compared to a pure semiconductor. A P-type semiconductor has more holes than a pure semiconductor. An N-type semiconductor has more electrons than a pure semiconductor. However, the charge of a P-type semiconductor and an N-type semiconductor is neutral. They are both still neutral. The reason for this is we have to remember the basis of charge. Charge depends on the balance of the number of protons and the number of electrons. If the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons, then the overall charge is neutral. However, if we have an excess of protons compared to electrons, then the substance has a positive charge. Whereas if we have an excess of electrons compared to protons, then the substance is said to be negatively charged. In this case, they are still equal. The total number of protons and the total number of electrons in the whole semiconductor is still the same and therefore they are neutral. What happens when we take a P-type semiconductor and an N-type semiconductor and we join them together? Let's say this is an N-type semiconductor. These represent the electrons. An N-type semiconductor also has holes. 
but the number of holes is very small. Let's say this is a p-type semiconductor. This represents the holes. A p-type semiconductor also has some free electrons, but only in a very small amount. When you put them together, what is naturally going to happen is, the n-type semiconductor has lots of electrons, and the p-type semiconductor has lots of holes. What will naturally occur is, the electrons are going to start flowing over from the n-type semiconductor to the p-type semiconductor. And once it flows over, then we have a region of negative charge and positive charge. The positively charged region and the negatively charged region are now depleted of their majority charge carriers. And therefore, this is called the depletion region. Due to the region of positive and negative charge, there is going to be an electric field from the positively charged region to the negatively charged region. Due to this, if any electron should try to cross over this region, it will be unable to because it will always be attracted back to the positively charged region. And therefore, electrons can no longer cross over the depletion layer to go on to the other side. The potential difference that's formed in the middle here is known as the junction potential. If we applied an external potential difference in the same direction as the junction potential, that is to say, we connect the n-type semiconductor to a positive terminal and the p-type semiconductor to a negative terminal, what's going to happen is the electrons are going to be drawn towards the positive terminal and therefore electrons will be flowing out this way. The holes from the p-type semiconductor will be attracted towards the negative terminal as well, which is to say more electrons will be pushed in here. What has happened now is the depletion layer has become even bigger and the junction potential has become even greater. Therefore, it is even harder now for any electron to try to cross the depletion layer onto the other side. This arrangement is known as the reverse bias. If we connected a potential difference across the diode in the opposite direction, which is to say we connect the n-type semiconductor to the negative terminal and the p-type semiconductor to the positive terminal, electrons are going to be drawn towards the negative terminal, whereas the holes are going to be drawn towards the positive terminal. As a result, this will occur. Move over and notice the depletion layer. Now the depletion layer is smaller. This means that the junction voltage has also become smaller. And it is getting easier for electrons to try and cross over this barrier. The larger the potential difference applied, the smaller the depletion layer, the lower the resistance of the diode, and the easier for electrons to jump over. Eventually, when the external potential difference is greater than the junction potential, what will happen is the depletion layer will become negligible, the junction voltage will become negligible, and the electrons will now be able to cross over. And so what will happen is electrons will be supplied from the circuit and there will be a continual flow of electrons from the N semiconductor to the P semiconductor. This is known as the forward bias. The diode will now allow electrons to pass through from the N-type semiconductor to the P-type semiconductor and current can flow in the circuit. And that is how a diode conducts electricity. If you've learned something from this video guys, please do me a small favor and hit that like button. It really does help the channel a lot. Thank you so much for doing that. If you enjoy videos like this, do subscribe. I'm producing at least one a week. See you guys in the next video.